Hello and welcome to the Cuyamonga Institute, our Q&A conversation for exploration series. I'm Paul Robert, the Executive Director and President of the Institute, and along with my wife, Laura Lee, the Director of Research, Education, and Outreach. And on behalf of our Board of Directors, Advisors, Volunteers, and Supporting Members, we want to thank you for joining us today. The Cuyamonga Institute is an independent, nonprofit research organization committed to researching consciousness and the human experience, following the footsteps of our founder, anthropologist, Dr. Felicitas Goodman. And our focus is reflected in three main areas, experience, education, and exploration. We respect the path of academic balance, the creative pursuit of science, while advancing, conserving, and restoring a direct experience of that deeper human connection to all of life. It's part of our mission to expand our own experiential uh, research with the multidisciplinary understanding that's available to us today. So as an educational institution, we take an open approach and we invite scholars in related fields that help broaden the scope of our own work and exploration. And that's why we call this conversation for exploration. These weekly Sunday discussions continue. We have many of them available on demand. We have a couple hundred presentations between webcasts and YouTube videos, um, et cetera, and uh, podcasts, et cetera. And all these presentations are free. So as a nonprofit, of course, we do invite you to be a supporting member. And we want to thank you, the community members who continue to support the mission of the Cuyamonga Institute. Today, we're going to talk about a religious group from the 12th century that rejected the standard religion of the day. They felt that the church had become too ingrained and had uh, been trapped in the material world. And they believed that everyone should have the opportunity to the sacredness, to a direct connection to God. Their belief system was about transcending to a simple life of prayer, of fasting, of nonviolence. They believed that your life will continue through reincarnation, that you'll have to go through all these cycles until one day you can release this material world. And they had a far more complex story than that, but that's a simple introduction to what we'll be discussing today. Well, like most of us, I'm not up on my medieval history. And while it's a fascinating era, I'm just glad I'm not living in it. And our most recent trip through France, Paul and I were more interested in the Ice Age cultures and art mm -hmm. left in caves. But we did spend a few days in Carcassonne, the well-known medieval walled village, now a popular tourist destination. Mm. And on the way there, we did stop at a medieval castle, also yeah. open for tourists, the dungeon of which was filled with all manner mm -hmm. of authentic, historic torture devices used by the Inquisition and detailed descriptions of how they were used. It was sobering to see what humans can do to one another. But, uh, and again, that made me appreciate the age in which we live where we can talk our way through our ideas openly for the most part, and where we each have the freedom to explore and adapt our own worldview. And we have access to the past, unprecedented access with which to expand our understanding of our world and our place in it. One of the ways that we do so is this forum with our many and varied guests. And one guest returns today, a medieval historian on the Cathars, the sect that was exterminated by the Inquisition. In the very brief Googling I've done on the Cathars, two points for me stand out and they're still meaningful for today. One is how important our worldviews are. What role does it play in justifying killing one another? Uh, over what, our view of reality, or to invent and use these torture devices, or to adhere to one's belief in the face yeah. of such a death mm -hmm. by torture. The Cathar's core view, this is the second point, was dualism. Dualism versus non-dualism, it's an ongoing debate to this day, an underpinning in a worldview that colors our thinking. Is the glass half full or half empty, or both? Is it an either or, or all of the above? Is it black, white, or shades of gray? But it goes further. Are we material beings or spiritual beings having a material sojourn? And do we go on once we give our bodies back to Mother Earth? Mm -hmm. So these are really important core ideas. And it's uh, interesting to see how earlier people's 
looked at this, what records they left behind, what happened to them, how this got integrated into the fabric of our culture to this day, mm -hmm. and how we're still struggling and exploring um, these ideas and the importance that we put to them. It's still, so, it's yeah. still ongoing conflict of um, violence in the name of God, which is never makes sense. That's yeah. You know, like how yeah. often this has to happen over well, and over. Well, we have a over. guest today, well versed yeah. in this and more, and the Cathars plight. David Lorimer, he's the global ambassador and program director of the Scientific and Medical Network, which describes itself as a worldwide community of scientists and other professionals mm -hmm. who seek to integrate evidence-based science with inner knowing, cultivated by spiritual practice and embodied in living values. David is also the editor of the Paradigm Explorer Journal and the chair of the Galileo Commission and the author of about a dozen books. He joins us from the south of France, which is Cathar country. Yeah. Welcome back, David. So good to have you here. Nice to be with you all. And thank you for your life mission also in, in really continuing this debate. Some say the Inquisition is still alive and well in mm -hmm. certain ways. But um, so give us a little bit of background. Um, tell us about what is your summarize, because we had a whole couple hours discussion with you on your first uh, visit with us. But summarize what your work is about and why the Cathars, how they relate to this body of work of yours. Well, thank you. That's a, a very general um, starting point. Um, I suppose I've always been interested in what we now sort of the field of consciousness and spirituality uh, and the esoteric aspect, the inner esoteric aspect of, of religion um, <clears throat> more probably than the belief systems and outer forms. <clears throat> and that means that you prioritize ex the experiential and, and you also have an expanded understanding of what it means to know. And in fact, just today, I've been um, reading a new book by Nick Spencer on <clears throat> science and religion. And and you, what you can what you can see as one of the themes going through this is is how how can we know and how can we validate what we know, but more importantly, and this this gets to the heart of the a number of uh, aspects of my work. Who has the authority? Who has the authority to say what reality is? And um, and what's the basis of that authority, political basis, economic basis, uh, or is it experience, um, as it is in the case of the, the Gnostics and indeed of Mary Magdalene, which we'll be talking about. Um, and so I, I, I think that the, the, I suppose I've, I've been on a number of different tracks. And so the track that is most relevant to today is my involvement with the Bulgarian White Brotherhood and Peter Dunov, um, Bayan Duno. This is a photograph of him here. Um, <clears throat> and it, the connection, historical connection between uh, the, the Bogomils uh, in Bulgaria and the Cathars in Languedoc, uh, dating back to the mid 12th century, 1167, there was a, um, <clears throat> a meeting at Saint Felix. And we had a, a sort of 850th anniversary of that in 2017. And, and so I, and that, that, um, that is also, it's an esoteric school, if you like. Um, and we recently had a lecture by Harry Salman on Steiner and Dunov, who are almost exact contemporaries. And both of them had an esoteric take on Christianity, um, which is, which is important. And then I, if if the if I'm looking more widely at my work, which is more the interface between science and consciousness, science and spirituality, science and esotericism, science and mysticism, mm -hmm. and uh, then um, the spirituality aspect is 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 a wing of um, all of that um, that activity. Yeah. Um, and so that and that I suppose is is a good starting point. Um, so I'll, I'll just hand the conversation back to you for the moment. 
<laughs> so the Cathars, I was intrigued when the last time we spoke, you said, oh, the Cathars, also one of uh, your passions. And so uh, we just want to know the big picture when we look at historically how long humankind has been struggling with the nature of reality. And indeed, you say, who has the authority to say? We're saying, oh, our worldview is sacred, and it's up to each of us to have that direct relationship with reality and and what in its vastness. And that's one thing that, that we're celebrating. Um, that's That's been an ongoing tug of war, hasn't it been? I think it helps to look historically at putting it, it helps to put in perspective what we're going through today, because there's a real struggle for worldviews um, going on today, and it, yeah. it affects all aspects of our lives. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, I think the <clears throat> what was going on, I think the, the larger cultural picture um, is that there was a thriving uh, Occitan culture um, in in that time, um, because you know, France had not yet become France, and so the, the rulers of different regions were the counts or the dukes. So, in the case of <clears throat> of, of, of the Cathars or this area, it was the Comte de Toulouse um, who was the main <clears throat> ruler, and then there were sub counts, um, as it were, uh, with the Comte de Foix, Count of Foix, and then the Viscount of Carcassonne. And they were they were related, <clears throat> and and the Occitan culture gave rise not only to um, Catharism uh, as we're talking about today, but also to the troubadours. Oh, and and yeah. the, there's a very interesting connection um, between them, um, and there are some uh, divergences as well. Um, but some of the connection, one of the basic connections, for instance, would be the the role of women. Um, that unusually for that time, women were able to own property in the in this area of France. Normally, they were the property of the men they married or the or the their fathers. Their women were just considered as property. Shut up. Whereas they 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 could actually own property here, and um, that this was one of the things that got under the nose of the Catholic Church was that the initiates, the parfait and the parfait, um, could be women. Mm. Indeed. Probably the greatest of all the Cathars is Esclamant de Foix, um, who was the daughter and sister of the succeeding generations, the Count of Foix. Um, and there's a new novel coming out um, for which my close friend uh, <clears throat> is uh, a, a historical consultant called 1209 The Devil's Crusade. And that hasn't yet come out, but it's based on a contemporary medieval manuscript, um, which yeah. gives an extraordinary insight into the life of Esclamant de Foix, who spent about 20 years literally living in caves uh, with a, a price on her head. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, <clears throat> you know, when, when she was used to living in, you know, some comfort, yeah. um, it was absolutely not the case. So women's status <laughs> being a key threat to the powers that be. Yeah, I can understand that one. That was that was one of the things. So you, so you have that you have this Occitan culture um, with its with its own code of ethics, um, and this is called parache, p a r a t g e, and this was a unique ethos, if you like, then which which was promoted there, and where the nobles uh, absolutely live by it. And what does it mean? It means it means nobility, integrity, yeah. honesty, compassion, consideration, courtesy, civility, those sort of- Honoring moral, women was part of that. Moral, this yeah, is moral and to the values. Yeah. Right? The troubadours were those, those knights and singing the praises and really romantic love, they say, was a big deal there. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And then, but the important thing um, is that there is a connection here between human love and divine love, uh, the, because the, the the human love of the troubadour and the poetry and the songs, this is called fin amour, in other words, refined love. And so there was already uh, a refinement of character that was going on um, with the, the troubadour impulse. And then the higher octave of this is divine love. Right. And, and so... The, 
there is there's, a, there's so the sensual and the spiritual, if you like, um, come together in 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 the culture, and although um, the Cathars themselves were ascetic, um, the 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 milieu in which they lived and they they had free exchange with the with the troubadours uh, was actually a very integrated one. And uh, and so there is a you can see there's a continuity between, as I say, the the, the sensual and, and the spiritual in this culture, and and so there were there were spiritual and theological reasons why the crusade was uh, you know, declared in 1209, um, but also um, political ones because they the, it was about how to get. Um, the Count of Toulouse to obey the Pope, and also how to get him to obey the King of France, and, and so you've got these, you've got this theological and political battle um, going on, and it's quite serious because if you get excommunicated in those days, um, and Raymond the Sixth of Toulouse was excommunicated on a number of occasions and uh, accused of harboring the Cathars. And then the Inquisition comes in uh, under the Dominicans in 1231. And so the, 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 the point is that, that um, the Inquisition was initiated, inaugurated, in order to crush the Cathars. Um, oh, as specifically. Media. That was the whole quest of the Inquisition. That, that's its origin. Absolutely. Oh, it's quite important to, to understand that. And what what's at stake um, for me is a system based on love um, being crushed by a system based on power. And, and if you look at the text of the debate in 1206 in Pamiers uh, between Esclamont de Foix and the papal legate, um, then one of the criticisms uh, that she has of them, you say that you preach uh, uh, the idea of love, mm. and yet you send in the the troops to massacre us, right? And um, and this is and she pointed out this is entirely inconsistent with Jesus's own teaching, right? You know, which is that not only should you be loving, you should love your enemies and and pray for those who persecute you, and if you and, and you should be non-violent by turning the other cheek. So th so this. Uh, and the way this developed, and this is an interesting historical point, is that once the church was institutionalized in 325 at the Council of Nicaea, um, then this whole master story of vicarious atonement, of Christ dying on the cross for our sins, um, and if you believe the Catholic Church, that gave you a ticket to heaven. And, and this was absolutely not the view of the Gnostics um, and the Gnostic Gospels, where Jesus is uh, depicted as a wisdom teacher. Uh, and this is particularly apparent also in, in the Gospel of the Beloved Companion, <clears throat> um, which I, I can say more about um, as, as our conversation develops. So um, they, I read that Cathar, the comes from Greek katharos, meaning pure, and that it actually has historical roots in Zoroastrianism of the Middle East, Egypt, and as you say, the Gnostics. So what is the development? Because these things didn't just grow up in isolation. These are threads that are woven in and out of, out of our living tapestry of our culture. So can you talk about those threads a little bit to put it even further into context? Yes. Um... I mean, I, th I think the what you might call the hard dualism um, is partly a creation of the Inquisition, um, <clears throat> and oh. and the, uh, the there is, there is I mean there are different forms of dualism, <clears throat> um, and the the idea of the the two principles. I'll just say a little bit about theodicy um, at this point because um, this was a, this is. A, a, a perennial problem for religions generally is how do you explain suffering if you have a, an omnipotent God, an omnipotent, om, omniscient God? 
And there's no easy answer <clears throat> to this. The scientific answer is that it's all random anyway. Um, and so you, it's just driven by survival. Um, the normal theological, uh, Christian theological view, um, which Jung didn't agree with, um, is that we're given free will and, and uh, it's mainly um, our fault that we have so much evil going on in the world. However, that's just moral evil. Um, so it, that that it, there's some mileage in the argument so far as moral evil is concerned, but then physical evil, which is natural disasters, <laughs> um, that's much more that's much trickier. And uh, I mean, in, in the Enlightenment, the key event that were, really exploded this debate in in the 18th century was a 1755 earthquake in Lisbon, where 55,000 people were killed on a Sunday morning. And a lot mm. of people were killed while they were attending mass. Mm. You know, it happened at 11 o'clock in the morning. And so this this was a huge problem. Why would God arrange yeah. um, you know, <laughs> for, for, to have an earthquake when um, the, the, the people who were in his church were, were, um, were in church and they got crushed when the building fell on top of them? Other ironic timing, yeah. Yes, and so the, the dualist um, view is that there's a good God and then a demiurge, and the demiurge is is the um, is the creator you know, of our world. And the reason it's imperfect is because he's imperfect. And so the the the, the explanation for suffering in this sense um, is that the the good God is not omnipotent. So that's that's where the problem arises, and um, uh, and the. Um, the, the, the demiurge, uh, or the prince of the world, as the Cathar scriptures and the Gospel of John um, call him, um, is the main player in our world system. And I, I think that's still true today. Well, it's um, better than laying it on Eve and all of women, original <laughs> sin, right? So, yeah. Yes, I mean, that's a whole other story. Um, but the, the, and so the, 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 um, the, the dualism... I mean, I've had these I've had these conversations with um, Jeanne de Quillon um, and her 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 sisters, who are she's the translator and editor of the Gospel of the Beloved Companion, mm -hmm. and she she feels um, that the the they were the the Cathars were and incidentally they were not called the Cathars at the time they were called the Good Men and Good Women. Les bons hommes et les bonnes femmes. It's only much later that the word cathar was invented and applied to them. Interesting. Um, so um, she's she said that the the real battle um, is not a kind of cosmological one. Um, well, it, it is in the sense that the prince of the world tries to trap us into um, you know material values, mm -hmm. um, but, but it's much more Jungian that they, that there is this other principle operating inside us, the shadow, as Jung would call it. Mm. And that's what we all have to deal with, um, and which is, in a way, that the struggle of that is described um, in the ascension narrative of the Gospel of the Beloved Companion, where, where you have to overcome the guardians and the, the vices, if you like, with virtues as you ascend the tree from darkness to light. And so the the the, the darkness to light um, contrast, if you like, is a better kind of vocabulary to use than than good and evil. Yeah, and, and look at I, how the shadow is very present in popular psychology today in the self help movement. Right, we have to recognize our shadow and bring it to light and um, mm -hmm. and forgive it and love it and send it on its way. So these ideas are very present in our culture today in sure. different terms, aren't they? Yes. I mean, actually, I don't think they're nearly present enough, mm. um, by which I mean, uh, I think that a teaching about the shadow um, should be integral to uh, any education on politics and on personal development. Mm -hmm. 
Because well, the, element of, the, um, the element of denial of not yeah having... yeah you, otherwise you project it onto somebody else and if it's okay. in a personal relationship you tr project it onto your partner or your family or friends mm. and look at stoicism and yeah. in our in our age of excess stoicism being a stoic um is making a comeback and you can look back to marcus aurelius and his book meditations the one good roman emperor right how to live how to live with moral values and and uh seeking your own growth yeah so interesting yes i think that's a very different i mean the Sto stoics i think stoicism um it, you're right it is making a comeback um and i think the kind of moral um courage and in the face of adversity yeah um is are the key points that you can you can derive from from stoicism uh, well, not and this, being this trapped is... in material values and hedonism right is that's mm -hmm. mean one of its main points that you made yeah yes yes yeah there were so, so many views but... in, in preparing for today's discussion with you uh there's so many views and elements to what the carthars were pursuing and understood and the religious values that made sense that that was enlightened for its day and still enlightened today in some elements of it, except for the fact, of course, the denial of the physical world and thinking that this is the problem and that we can't know God until we deny this world and that element of of not having any kind of sacred connection to this world as well. And and so that that was the really the thing that triggered me in this discussion as I looked at how how this whole thing manifested itself and how how much it was a threat to the the church. That these people could come forth and have such a such a drastic view, and not only hold their view, but say that view of the church is the one that's wrong. They they were strong enough. They were they were you know they were standing in the corner saying you know these people have lost their way. They're too they're too much into the material world, and you you can't know God through the material world. Yes, that's right. I mean they they basically were were uh, like the original Christians, mm. and that's what they regarded themselves as. And because the 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 emphasis on community, on on mutual support, uh, on healing, um, that that was all very much to the fore um, yeah. in the Cathars. And and I think I think Jeanne would probably say that the 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 uh, sort of uh, disregard of the world again has been exaggerated. Um, by by the records of the Inquisition, and and the, and also, and this was the first the Inquisition introduced the idea of a police state, mm -hmm. um, yeah. because the the you were encouraged to um, betray your neighbour. It was it was it was regard you know you would you would get some points um, by betraying your neighbour if you thought they were had, they were Cathar sympathisers, and and in the sense that the uh, they regarded the Catholic Church as the Antichrist. Um, the idea that they could give up their beliefs um, and abjure those beliefs and convictions and then go over to the Antichrist was unthinkable. Okay, so that explains why 225 people at one of those battles chose to just jump into a fire and and burn then recant and join the yeah. opposition can you talk about some of the horrific yeah totally. i mean there are happened? many there are many massacres as it were and a very good book on this is by zoe oldenburg called um, massacre at monsegur which came out in about 1960 so rather before the cathars became popular or in the popular culture um but the one you're talking about was was the fall of monsegur in 1244 which was really the pretty much the end of the resistance uh, above the ground. Mm. I mean, the last Cathar um, to be burnt at the stake was uh, Guillaume de Bellibast in 1321. Um, so that's quite a long time after that. Then Heribus, which was another Cathar fortress, that fell in 1256, but there weren't very many Cathars there. Um, and that so it didn't it it the the what happened at Montségur was that Esclamont de Foy um, in 1220 or so 
realized that they needed a fortress where they could they could be and be protected. And Monsegur itself means safe mountain. Mm. Segur is secure, if you see what I mean. Yeah. And, and and so this 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 place was um you know uh done up and and arranged so that a community of about 400 people could live on the top of that hill. It's unbelievable. If you go there now and you think, God, 400 people up here, it's not possible. And where do they get enough water and food? And mm. and, and and so that was the last. But the the, the, the first of the, of the sieges and, and battles is 1209 in July, on the 22nd of July, which is the Mary Magdalene feast day uh, in Bézier. And, and so there were 20,000 um uh, troops and they slaughtered seven thousand people um and they including they women and children yeah and they, they didn't just slaughter um them you know the heretics they slaughtered everybody oh, and, and you know, there's a very famous quotation from Ar Ar arnold de, de amori the papal legate said well burn them all god will know his own and so this this was and then carcassonne was pretty much next on the list. Um, and they they cut off the water supply. And this this happens in a number of places where the, the siege was broken because they cut off the water supply. And and in, in the case of Carcassonne, um, they uh, also had a huge number of animals inside the walls. And so that increased the increased the pressure. And then uh, uh Savel, the, the Viscount, he came out um and um, to to sue for for peace and for an arrangement, and Simon de Montfort just shut him up in a dungeon, uh, and he died a few months later. And this this was an incident which was regarded as an absolute betrayal of Parachi. This was perfidious behaviour. Mm -hmm. There was no human dignity accorded to um, to this enemy in inverted commas, and he was only twenty four. Oh. You know, it's, it's so interesting to walk through Carcassonne and witness the torture devices in that mm -hmm. castle, but mm -hmm. then to walk through this beautiful city, views and the architecture and it's charming, of course, yeah. as a tourist mm -hmm. spot, you know, and yeah, the cobblestones and you just think, you know, it's so beautiful. And then to have this kind of horrific stuff going on in yeah, it's just it's just boggles, kind of boggles the emotional mind there, when you learn a little bit of the the histories. Yeah, and I'm just scratching, barely scratching a surface. So, yeah. But you know, and you wonder how how do power plays work so that the most ruthless people who are capable of ordering the slaughter of your fellow human being against people who were vegetarians i'm assuming because they didn't want to hurt animals <laughs> in part you know how and how do you stand that. up to something like that how do you be a pacifist and be all about love in the face of somebody coming in to torture and kill you i mean well that's what they did yeah but the, the, i think the point is that um you know I, we having this conversation last sunday um, with with Jeanne, and she said you have to understand where everybody is coming from Mm -hmm. uh, Simon de Montfort was a was a pious Christian um, who thought he was doing the right thing yeah. by extirpating um, the heretics, and um, and in the process, you know, he he you know, he he made a lot of um, you know, he made a lot of money. He made a lot of conquests and so on. And he, he was given various titles, and then in twelve nineteen, I think it was. Um, he was struck by a rock you know, just outside uh, Bézier on the head, um, and that was the end of him. And one of one of the, the sort of legends within the Cathar tradition is that the great thing is that that, that rock was launched by women, mm. and uh, it's yeah. so he came to a violent end. Um, and there's a certain parable in that because you know he who uses the sword will die by the sword, of Jesus. Mm -hmm said that's um, of his own back yeah yeah there's so much to this there's so much of this story that i can't help but thinking about the world that we live in today and how much that's still reflected that we can sit here and shake our heads and discuss that what happened in history 
But at the same time, oh, there's something about the you. story of humanity repeating itself over and over and over again and not learning its lessons and not stepping into a state of quote unquote enlightenment that we can we can transcend some of that and say, did we learn anything from that? Are we going to continue to do this? Is there something, what is this within ourselves as a humanity that continues this kind of a path? And we see this manifesting in different ways nowadays, but it's still the story continues. There's still yeah, that. And look at our tax dollars supporting all the, the weapons that can destroy yeah. the world. And we yeah. must do it because if we don't, the yeah. enemy I mean, will. Or yeah. we must support AI because if we don't, some other company will. And, yeah. right? and it's not even a political discussion. It really is a discussion about being a human and what it Thank means, that our role on this planet, why we are the alien species that comes in and seems to to somehow not, yeah. not find a way to survive without without this kind of activity. You know? and, why, and why can't we just all get along? <laughs> or as Linda Paladin was saying just yesterday, hey, we're all native to Earth. Oh, yeah. We're all natives. Na na native Earthlings, yeah. Does it matter which part of the world you come yeah. from or where you grew yeah. up? We're all native to Mother Earth, yeah. right? So in the end. So. Yeah, well, I think the, I think it, it reflects the collective level of consciousness. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and that's, and in a sense, you say, well, this is what's happening and this is where we are. And if the outer reflects the inner, then the, the people in power um, have a level of consciousness which leads them to believe they're doing the right thing. Right. Even though we you know we might, from a wider, deeper perspective, say it's all wrong. It's completely wrong. And um, and the I think the I mean I think there is there is some there is a degree of awakening going on. Yes. Um, but the question is, is it enough? Um, and if how I, I had a conversation with with Satish Kumar um, this week um, because we have our mystics and scientists on love, compassion, and forgiveness. Mm. So I designed this program uh, this year because I thought this is what we need to be talking about: yes. love, yeah. compassion, and forgiveness. And um, You're also, he, he froze for a moment, but you're also underscoring the importance of our worldview, the importance of our philosophy of life, and why we're still at, at battling with this. But he's touching on something even more yeah. significant, and that is consciousness itself, and that as a humanity, as we raise ourselves up, those particular leaders are going to be reflected in what we are. As, as and who humanity. we choose as leaders. And what, and what yeah. even if it's not a... A conscious cho choosing it's 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 just something as an it emanates from who we are as a humanity right there's a that opportunity so i do yeah. acknowledge what you're saying david that we're at a we're at this transitional point in time and this is why laura and i have devoted ourselves to this work and what we do here with this institute that there is this opportunity for us to to continue to push forward with this idea that we can have an impact on the level of consciousness that we can have an impact on uh the fact that there's there's a transition happening and that even though it seems sometimes overwhelming we have to do our part we have to put our drop in the ocean we have to continue to do something that has an effect that that rises us up and writing our relationship with ourselves, our community right. and our world is really a sacred quest right. yeah so yes and i think these circumstances in a way they they provide the challenge for us um, to say no, yeah. we're not going down this route, and I, I think there's, you know, there's two, there's two kind of visions of the future, um, which are in a sense competing at the moment. Um, you've got the the official, you know, UN World Economic Forum billionaires, um, the people who who want to drive us into Agenda 2030. Um, uh, and do it on their terms. And they'll, I, I listened to a podcast this week where somebody said, well, we started with with the nudge, you know, behavioral psychology nudge. And, and a lot of this has been applied to us um, in the last few years. And then if the nudge doesn't work, then you give a shove. Um, and I just love that, that, the ideas of, of a shove. So this, this is a, a centralized, technocratic, digital surveillance, um, lock everybody down, keep them under control, stop them from moving around. Um, uh, and it's focused on um, quite a narrow view of reality. It's it's underpinned by reductionism. Um, and power, I, yeah. right? And yeah. power, uh, totally yeah. power. So that's one. The other one, which I'm working for, you're working for, 
um, is a regenerative future um, where we start working in harmony with each other, we work in harmony with nature, um, we we bring in um, healing, uh, we pay attention to trauma, uh, which is a huge issue at the moment, uh, and we we scale towards the local, and you know we decentralize as much as possible, and uh, and we we empower people to develop themselves, and and you know be the beings that we are meant to be, and um, and so that's kind of that's 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 a really a spiritual view uh, of evolution because the first view corresponds to mechanistic materialism. Yeah. By which the I mean the dead universe where, that's just where, slowly the winding dead up. Universe and yeah. We're basically machines. Yeah. Uh, we're hackable animals. These these are the uh, that hackable animal is a Yuval Noah Harari expression, uh, or we're we're just programmable machine biochemical machines, and we need a few implants and upgrades, you know, to get the operating system working better. To get our marching orders, right? Yes, uh, and the other view uh, is that we have an irreducible spiritual component, and um, and that I think that all of this this world view is being reinforced by many scientific developments at the moment, mm -hmm. um, which show that there's one life and one mind, and that we are all individual expressions of this yeah. one mind and one life. And how do we behave towards each other as a result? We treat each other as if we are each other. Yeah. And this is the golden rule. Yeah. And I, I've written a book about the life review um, which um, in the near-death experience and elsewhere. And, and that's the, 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 the take-home lesson of the life review um, mm -hmm. is, is that we will experience what it is that we gave rise to in other people. And, and <clears throat> that, that, that you know, has both a plus and a minus side, if you like, that we will experience the love we gave, but we'll also experience something of the suffering that we created. I and if you put this on a macro comments. scale, yeah. um, then the people who are misguidedly, um, you know, slaughtering their fellow human beings um, for, for, for what they think is very good reasons, um, they they will eventually um, come to realize that this is in, not in accordance with the laws of the universe. And if I just put this in a shorthand way, then what Peter Dunoff said is when you go to the other side, you will be examined on how you have applied the law of love. Mm. Mm. And that's, I think, an extraordinary statement and, and one that we we could all do with taking on board. And if that imagine if that was the basis of the education system that you told children that we're all one, um, we are individual expressions. We must respect everybody, and and but we must treat each other, um, you know, with the utmost sensitivity. And what goes around comes around. You know, it's really also saying we all have direct access to whatever this driving force of the universe is. And therefore, that does take power away from somebody who's trying to say, hey, I'm the voice of authority, follow me, I'm going to dictate mm -hmm. how you live. Which comes right? back to the car so, parts. I mean, it's yeah. very, yeah, there's it's, very opposing views about where does power, true power lie, and how are we judged, and what's the world about, and what is the world made of, what's the nature of reality? I mean, these are very key questions. So, um, and even in Egypt, right, didn't they weigh your soul against the way Yeah, somebody feathers? has just put that into the chat. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh. Yes. Yeah. eating mott, mott at our death, weighing yeah. our heart with an ostrich feather. Thank you, Lorianne. So, yeah. um, so these are very, very important ideas that we're still grappling with. Right. And it really determines who you are and how you show up in your life, right? These are, these are things that underlie us, whether we're conscious of them or not. These are the underpinnings of our worldview, mm -hmm. how we, how we make these choices. So, um, yeah. Well, that kind of comes comes back to the Carthers saying that you didn't need to have the priesthood, that you could have direct connection yes. to the divine. Yeah. This is actually a very central point <clears throat> for Gnostics in general. Uh, but because the if you if you look at the, the way they categorized Gnostics um, categorized, and that you you'd have the 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 initiates, um, that, and they they were the people who recognized 
the breath, the pneuma, uh, born from above, mm. um, the baptism of the fire, baptism of the spirit. And then you had pistis, the, 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 the people of the level of psyche, um, who, who believed, but who didn't know. So the Gnostics, the Gnostics with Gnosis, they knew, they knew that the essence of who they are is the essence of, of, of God, is the essence of reality. Mm. Uh, and and once, you, once you have that direct access, you don't need somebody else to tell you what to do. Um, and so the, in that sense, the, the, these movements were, were countercultural and transgressive, um, as um, one of the experts on, the, on this um, says. Um, and they still are. Um, because if you if you question authority of various type, then you know you you cast yourself as not conforming, not complying, um, and then you can be even regarded as a threat. And that's what that's how the church regarded um, the heretics. But it's also important to underline that it was only gradually that this what. Karen King calls the master story. It's only gradually it actually evolved, uh, but because it there was a lot, there were all plural communities um, who had slightly different beliefs, yeah. and there was also it was like, a thousand petals, you know, a thousand flowers blooming, and and gradually, the same source, this, right? Yeah. yeah, this master story of of redemption, you know, the Lamb of God slain for the sins of the world, and um, this 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 fitted into the authoritarian structure. Um, and, and that was what was eventually taken up. Um, and and the, the, the Gnostic Gospels just disappeared from, from the late fourth century. They disappeared until the late 19th century, and particularly the Nag Hammadi findings of um, 1945. And, it, it, and since that time, we've got a very different picture of Jesus and a very different picture of Mary Magdalene. Yeah, when those manuscripts are rediscovered and decoded. So two questions. So are there other missing manuscripts, do you suspect, that are either suppressed well, or that, you found? Well, that, that brings me on to this, the Gospel of the Beloved Companion. Um, because the, the, it's, I, I regard this Gospel as the, the ultimate gnostic gospel and and there are various things that are important about it but let me just give you the, the kind of history um okay. it, it it came out it was a, uh, only published in 2010 for the first time oh wow and it was it was released by by a community who'd had the manuscript in their possession for centuries and um, and there was an occitan translation of the alexandrian greek um, in the 12th century. And so that meant, and this is an important point, that ordinary people had who could read, which weren't that many, um, but they had access to the gospel in their own tongue. Otherwise, you'd have to be reading Latin or Greek. And so this, and, and then if you go further back in the kind of lineage of this, um, then it's, it is known that Mary Magdalene came to France in about AD 43, and she spent the last 20 years of her life preaching and um, uh, and teaching uh, in this area, broadly speaking, it's a you know, few miles along the coast. Uh, and, and there are many examples of um, Mary Magdalene um, on a statue or in a, in a stained glass window, um, you know, opposite Jesus or ones of them together. And I suppose the most remarkable um, a manifestation of this is to be found in the Catholic Church of Foix, F-O-I-X. And you can look this up online. And in, in there, there is a frieze, which is about half a meter high, and, and it depicts the Last Supper. And oh, and on Jesus' left is Mary Magdalene. Yeah. Right. How many disciples are there? Twelve. Uh, it really, you know, it's it's Quite, they don't draw attention to this, needless to say. So let me just get back to the Gospel of Beloved Companion, because the, okay. what you've got, what 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 we've all, already had extant are, are three versions, three manuscripts of the Gospel of Mary. So that, in other words, Gospel of Mary Magdalene. 
but they're, they're all fragments, they're all incomplete. And, and so this, what, what I think happened, and, and I can't you know, entirely prove this historically, is that the, 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 this, this Greek manuscript was effectively the treasure of Montségur that was um, taken out at the last minute. And Jean told me that that was one of the things the Catholic Church wanted. They wanted this manuscript. Oh, okay. <clears throat> because it, it's dynamite. Um, because what uh, it's, and so the complete Gospel of Mary Magdalene, um, this Gospel of the Beloved Companion, it, it's written by um, Mary Magdalene. When I say written by, um, it's you, n none of the Gospels are exactly written by the person they say. But 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 the voice is 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 the yeah. voice of Mary Magdalene, and then then what I found was if I looked if I I've, I've done a forty page um, uh, textual comparison between the Gospel of John and the Gospel of of um, um, the Bible Companion. So John was the beloved disciple, um, and it's pretty clear to me, and also Aline van der Meer. Um, who's much more of a scholar in this area than I am, um, that there's some sense in which the Gospel of John um, is a revision of the Gospel of the Beloved Companion, and Beloved Disciple is substituted for Beloved Companion. Um, and then we come on to the question of authority and the missing pieces in the Gospel of Mary, because at the end of the Gospel of Mary and the end of the Gospel of Beloved Companion, it's Mary who gathers the the, the migdala as the tower. Uh, so Mary is the tower, um, and there are various texts in in gospel which which explain the symbolic uh, meaning of that. And so they, she gathers them in, in, to, in her house in Bethany, and, and she's and she comforts them, um, and she raises her right hand and greets them. This is a prophetic gesture, gesture of spiritual authority. And Peter says to her, sister, tell us, you, the, the, the rabbi loved you more than anyone, any other women. Tell us something about your understanding, which we neither know nor understand. And then she proceeds to relate this ascension of the cosmic tree process, which I was referring to just now, uh, which is the most extraordinary text. If you don't get shivers up your spine um, when you first read this text, then you haven't understood it. And, and then so she gives this secret and, then, and she achieves in this vision, this ascension, she achieves gnosis that she knows that, uh, that she is the I am. And this is what is known as the completion of completions as I understand it. And she's referred, to, she's referred to as the completion of completions in other Gnostic texts. I think the Pistis Sophia, for instance. And then, so she falls silent at the end because it's in silence that the, 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 the rabbi, that Yeshua taught her this. Um, and then he, Peter says, well, that must be a, lot, a load of nonsense. And why, why would he have talked to a women and not us? And so this is, so Peter is sort of set up um, against Mary Magdalene. Um, and Andrew ch chimes in um, with Peter, but Matthew, Levi, uh, supports um, Mary's view. Uh, and uh, in, on the set, in the sense that, you know, if he loved her more than us or more than any other women, um, then why wouldn't he have? given her this teaching and so the the te the authority of mary magdalene um, and this is what's so critical i think is is an authority of a lived experience and what what's what's happened is i mean there is this incredible mystical tradition within within catholicism um, but but what what's what happened is is that the the institution took over and and the emphasis was mainly on belief yeah. um and faith uh, and obedience to authority rather than on accessing this direct experience uh, for yourself and part part of the problem and this is still an issue in a sense is that the gnostics were accused of being elitists but in fact how many people um That's take the a spiritual life 
seriously enough to you know to prioritize it and the answer is not very many yeah you also have to wonder how much the church then went and took these and whitewashed it to their own purposes and rewrote a few things and when you were describing the the artwork of the last supper isn't there famously one where it looks like one of the disciples was painted over originally a woman and became a man right so there's it's, a lot of I mean, there's, there's a, there's a, Leonardo, the story. a yeah. famous Leonardo Last Supper, yeah. um, where where it's where it's sort of ambivalent, if mm -hmm. you like. Okay, but I, I, yes, I mean, I think this is um, the Aline van der Meer book is called Mary Magdalene Unveiled, um, and it is a few hundred pages of scholarly treatment um, of all this. And so, anybody who's really interested in a chapter and verse should. A, a deep dive book. to be had. Yeah. Deep dive. Yeah. Thank you. Um, questions and comments? Let's go to, let's go to, um, I know there's lots of interesting stuff going into the chat room. I also want to give a shout out to the new universe story. So there's another whole movement of cosmologists with Brian Swim and our dear friend Monica de Raspols and others who are looking at, hey, it took the universe 14 billion years to create us. The universe is one organism of which we are just becoming conscious to celebrate and recognize this, but we're all one entity, um, really. We can't say that we're this alone. We're stardust, mm -hmm. right? We're part of that whole evolution. Mm -hmm. And how and what's coursing through us is that, the universe unfolding itself and it's becoming. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of science, as you say, that's coming forward to look at, look at who we really are. And yes, I've um, read. I've read. Help underpin um, these. Yeah, his, I've read his yeah. latest book, and the, you're you're right. It's a participatory, co-creative universe, yeah. and and so we are we are an inherent part of that of that process of emergence, if you like. Mm -hmm. And I think the other the other interesting point historically is that you know the co-founder of natural selection, um, apart from Darwin, was Alfred Russell Wallace. Yeah. And, and he was he was interested in spiritualism. He was a, he was a, a heretic in a number of respects. He was very interested in land reform, and he was very skeptical about the the vaccination story of the time. And mm. that's a whole, a whole other issue. But the point the point I, I wanted to bring up here is that he said that if if we have evolution in the natural world, then why shouldn't we have spiritual evolution? Yeah. And so he actually he actually said that he was a great supporter of psychical research and and um you know the early work on telepathy the society for psychical research um and he even tried to get huxley to come along to a seance you know to experience these things for himself so huxley huxley was absolutely naturalistic and materialistic in his outlook although he was a great man in terms of his human vision I think, but he and he and Wallace were in a sense on other ends of the spectrum. I want to also say that there's so much resurgence of some of this, our capacities, who we are, that's bubbling up today and making itself known. And one of the guests that we have, we just booked, is Wendy Coulter, who teaches how to have medical intuition, how to read and scan, mm -hmm. right, what's going on. And uh, Joseph Goldfeder, a member of our community, uh, took her course. And so I'm, I'm thinking, why don't we recognize these abilities or that they can be learned and that we have these receptor sites? Mm -hmm. And and I was just thinking, you know, uh, a shark can go over um, the sand, swim over the sand and detect fish underneath or creatures hiding under the sand because it can detect their bioelectric field, whatever. field right? Mm -hmm. Why shouldn't we? Other creatures can do it. Why don't we recognize right. more of right. our sensing and receptors and read of the universe and the energies around us? We see it in other creatures. Why not us? Why are we suppressing these abilities? Mm -hmm. Right. So that's going to be a very exciting. Um, this coming is sort out of the history of up April twenty first. Go ahead. And that's the history of religion itself has been this this yeah this, this separation. And when we talk about denying the body and denying this world to meet god versus those who uh, that yeah. the, the opposite direction 
talking about embodied spirituality, which seems to be a term nowadays that's all encompassing, talking about that the, the divine is available to us in this moment, in this time, that we can live it through ourselves, the body and the world that we live in, because Thank it's you. that denial of all those features that you're talking about, that that ability, those those we're living in a temple, right? This, and Mother Earth is a temple. And if we are um dissing the material world, how do we treat our, our own physical planet? Couldn't we, can't we combine the two mm -hmm. to say it's all sacred ground? Is that what you're that is that's part of it, yes. Yeah. And I also and I'm kind of I'm also kind of like circling around different topics as we talk because there's yeah. so many things that come up. But the other thing is is that in today's world, the Catholic Church, of course, is is trying to reorganize itself. The Pope is progressive from from the church's point of view a pretty very progressive church trying to change the direction and be more inclusive because traditional religions are suffering their the level of a, of a, of power and and ability to to uh, their stranglehold is lessening it's lessening so they have yeah. to change they have to come up with different ways of manifesting which is not a good i mean not a bad thing it's a good time for this to be happening and so that it, that we can take religion to a new a new place, possibly a new way for it to um, have a role in the yeah. uh, the growth of humanity. But coming back also to this idea that um, that that it's from within that we can have that direct experience and that we can control our own destiny if we can somehow. I think that resolves so many things. I'm, I'm uh, you know, as we talk about this, it resolves so many things that if we can come to some place of peace within ourselves and within humanity to find our religions actually supporting that. <laughs> well, I, I have the question coming up. What if the powers that be were Cathars? What if they had adapted it? And then I was thinking, no, oh. that's not going to be because no Cathar would create the Pope in this institution and this stranglehold, right. right? That's the antithesis of what they were about. No, so, absolutely. Yeah. And they yeah. didn't have, they had houses um, which they met in, uh, but they didn't have churches and institutions. And, and after the fall of Monsecure, a lot of them moved into caves mm. in the, wow. in the, in, and this applied also to Esclamont de Foix, that she, she was, you know, on the run effectively you know, living in caves, and but she could be betrayed by people, and she wasn't um, in the end. Um, but it's really, what it's about is living spirituality. Yeah. And that's what they were doing. They were, oh. they were living, compassionate, kind, healing, supportive. Um, and that's why they were called the good people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The they're... good men and the good women, yeah. because they were good. You, you know, know it's that's interesting that... it's very, very simple. You know, we don't, yeah. it's not rocket science to be kind and considerate um, and sensitive. And so, I mean, I've got lots to learn in that <clears throat> that department myself. But, but isn't that know. what Jesus was espousing? Isn't, wasn't that his whole um, basis of his doctrine? Mm -hmm. By the way, when we were touring the, the pay, uh, around Les mm -hmm. in France, and we were going to all the Paleolithic painted caves, many of the entrances had been occupied in medieval times. And so you could see a little bit of that evidence. Um, so that was they didn't penetrate deep into the caves, but you could see that they were pointing out medieval mm -hmm. artifacts there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So interesting. Yeah. Uh, let's go to yes, a few. Go, go ahead first. Go ahead. Yeah, no, we have we have a number of those in our area as well, going back to twelve thousand BC. Yeah. And, and you see dates, people having written their name and date, you know, from about sixteen hundred onwards. Um, yeah. So I think the locals knew about these caves. Yeah. Well, so, I'm going to open it up for some uh, further questions and communications and people's comments. And Tony's going to go first. Tony got his hand up. And who else wants to follow Tony? Raise your hand. Hey, Tony. Hello. And uh, and thank you, David. This is uh, very fascinating. I have two questions. Uh, one is an observation, an observational question. And the other, the second, is a self-serving question. Um the observational question, having been in Toulouse many times, all the street signs are still both in Akatan and French. Mm -hmm. And so the Akatan survived, yet the Cathars did not. Uh, in, and they're not all that far apart, of course, as you pointed out. Uh, wh what happened? How did, how did, how did this? Well, the, I mean, the culture, the culture in terms of the principles that underlie, underlay it, as I was explaining, specifically this idea of Parache, uh, was crushed um, you know, by a much more patriarchal structure, you know, which has dominated ever since. But you're right, the, 
the long the the long doc is there's a small revival and on the other hand um i've got a, a father of a friend of mine um you know he was he was fluent in occitan and a few people are um and the bouvier is the most famous occitan um the cowherd um it's it's a very famous song about the cathars but it's a parable of, of how they were how they were treated and um, so so i i think um historically um it it the the principles of the culture did disappear and the language was a sort of residue okay well i i just found that very interesting in, in particularly in the context of this okay the self-serving question uh i will be attending and giving talks at a conference in Antibes uh, this summer, but actually this fall, in October. If I want to take an extra week to pursue Mary Magdalene, what, where would I start to find out the right way to do this? I guess good. Good question. Yes. Um, well, I do, I do an annual retreat, but it's full um, for, for this year. Um, I think I, I, I can give you a number of of places to to go, I think there are two, there are two or three axes. Um, one is that you need to go, you need to go to Saint Bon, um, which is the cave um, where she's meant to have spent some time. But the the initiates seem to think that actually it's, it's the wrong cave, uh, and there's another one not so far away. Uh, Nicola Amadora is doing a tour here um, in in September as well, and I'm. I'm I'm currently reading her absolutely extraordinary book called Unleashing Love. Mm -hmm. So she's very keen on on that. Nicola Amadora, A M A D O R A. You can look look it up. And so that's one axis. The next place you need to go is Sainte Marie sur Mer, um, which is where um, the the women are meant to have landed in this rudderless boat. Uh, and that's quite an interesting place to go. Then you should go to Narbonne. Um, and um, and then otherwise, then it becomes the castles, um, the various Cathar castles, uh, Perpertus, um, Qui, uh, Queribus, um, Puylerance, uh, Montségur, and there are various others. And then the and then you have to go to Foix to see this um, frieze I was talking about, and Foix is a really charming place. It has a wonderful museum in the castle so the castle of foie is well well worth a visit and then you have to go down into the ariege valley to have a look at the caves um lombrive is the most famous l-o-m-b-r-i-v-e-s um but i i can put you in touch with one or two people <clears throat> um if, you're if gonna need more than a week tony obviously <laughs> but, 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 oh, well, yes let's say it, it will be in october not september and yeah and I wish I could be on your your uh, retreat, but I, I would. Uh, I've been wanting to explore this for decades, so so uh, so, so this really fits in. You know, I have been to Carcassonne, as Paul and Laura have, and and I've been moved by these things. So um, it definitely interests me a lot. Tony's also a big fan of Jean d'Arc. Yes, uh, that's that's very very interesting um, connection because the the. The Jean de Quillon says there's a continuity between the Cathars and Jeanne d'Arc. Mm. Really? Yeah. Um, Do you want to just expand on that? Well, well, she was, yes, I mean, she was, um, she get, she received the necessary inner guidance to do what she what she had to do, um, and so insofar as she developed these faculties, it would be consistent of her being a part of this tradition um, that Jeanne de Quillon is, is, is an exponent of. And what's, what's really significant for me is that the, <clears throat> the, um, the, this tradition, mainly women, um, goes right back to the Cathars. Um, and that's, that's why they've got this gospel. Um, and it managed to continue under the radar you know, for many centuries, and they kept discussing when to release the gospel. 
and and uh, they decided to um, release it in 2010. Some members did not agree; they didn't want it released ever. Um, but what was important is that it speaks to our time. I mean, it speaks to all times, in my view, but it speaks to our time um, because of its simplicity and directness, and the the centrality of Mary Magdalene as the beloved companion, and therefore the masculine and the feminine working together and not competing, um, and the emphasis on, on gnosis and realizing the deeper truth of being. Yeah. And this sacred marriage idea of male and female. Correct. The divine. And the bridal chamber. I mean, the Gospel of Philip um, is, is the most developed. Um, you know, uh, members case. of our community and uh, Jane Elworthy and her partner, Jackie, who yeah. Jane gave us a lovely uh, on women in the hand drum and how many portrayals there are of women using small hand drums. Right. Jane's a drummer, but they also lead a tour through Mary Magdalene country in France. Yes, yeah, they do do some of that. So, but yeah, yeah. yeah. So this is well, totally David, David, the imagination would really, of many. Yeah. David, I'd really appreciate anything you could point out to me. I will drop my email address in here. And uh, yeah. and you know, I like to go for the depth. Uh, that's a fascinating idea that somehow this idea got to Dom Rame, where, mm -hmm. where Dark was born and raised. Um, so I, I'm fascinated by yes, that. Well, you see, the, the, the Fedi, as they were called, um, the nobles who lost all their land, um, and yeah. they they then moved to different parts of France, and 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 the, the tradition was kept going but underground. And the Huguenots mm -hmm. were, um, you know, a development from that same in the same kind of continuity of of tradition, yeah. and and so obviously that's part of the Protestantism and the Reformation, but in in a way you could say that the the Cathars were the start of the Reformation, um, yeah. you know, but they were they were Protestants in the sense they were protesting right. against the existing institution. Right. And the you read the there's an essay um, by Simon Weil, W E I L, um, on the Romanesque Renaissance. It's called, um, and it's all about the Occitan culture and how the Occitan culture stood for love over and against power and control of, of the centralized Catholic Church representing the empire. And, and so for her, Rome, in a kind of analogical sense, um, stood for this primacy of power. And so you have the primacy of power against the primacy of love. And I fear if we don't learn that and Here we today, are, you know, be... a few hundred years later, this is what we have to we we spiritually aware people we have to come together to insist not just on the primacy of consciousness but on the primacy of love yeah there you go um i want to hear from bernice um thank you tony yeah yeah bernice that she's a someone i'm in touch with and i want to hear from her oh, marie daly okay asking what is the significance of jesus's suffering or did he not suffer as an ascended master but bernice now you have more to say and we want to meet you so if you want to turn well on. this is so thoroughly fascinating to me because my uh, my my work has been focusing on the uh, feminine divine or goddess tradition and so forth but also um in the uh and they're looking at the evolutionary pattern of, of Teilhard de Chardin, I think uh, this addresses so many of the things you've been talking about in in dealing with um, Jungian shadow and 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 the the principle of the uh, I call it principle of the of the of the feminine. But I I've been interested. You know, my question has to do with suffering and. Um, if if one if one recognizes that Jesus didn't die for us and so forth, did he suffer? Was he an ascended master, according to the thinking of uh, that you're presenting? Um, and so he did not quote suffer. Um, I, I I'm all for the not dying for my sin thing, but I have this this thing about the. The, the complete 
centrality of suffering in in human experience and in in the planet and the cosmos. Right. So it feels to me that that reflection of divine um, experience should not just be somehow ascended or trans tr somehow transcended by um, by a certain um, power that that most of us don't experience. So yeah, how to yeah yeah and and yeah. then that suffering is a it, to me is enormously important um, because of the point you're making about love and um, and the suffering allows me to have some sense of uh, experience compassion um, which I I think typically has to begin with oneself but then I can have I can see you differently. I can feel your experience differently. And the cultivation of compassion, which is, um, which is about love. Uh, so, yeah. So that's my question. <laughs> yes. If you can, if you can I, I follow that, I'd appreciate. Um, it. <laughs> well, the 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 view, the the community view, um, you know, deriving from the gospel of love and companion, um, is that um, he 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 was really put to death by the establishment. Um, so he, because he, you know, that, that if you look, if you read the Gospel of the Beloved Companion, um, then you'll, you'll find that he stood out against the law and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the people who just paid lip service to mm -hmm. um, the spiritual life, but who set the rules. He said, you, you've, you've locked people out and thrown mm. away the key mm. um and his 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 mission was to bring bring in this new level of being i mean mm -hmm. think about um the, the extraordinary story of, of nicodemus in, in, mm -hmm. in chapter five of john of john but it's also integrally in the gospel of beloved companion and he said what you're a a teacher of Israel, and you don't understand the baptism by fire, the baptism by the Spirit, and and, and he finds it incredible uh, that and so these so what what he stands for, uh, and he's directly inspired. And, and I I meant to mention that instead of my father and I are one, yeah. which is he says the Spirit and I are one, and the spirit mm -hmm. is Sophia, which right, is the divine right. wisdom. Absolutely. Right, exactly, which brings me back uh, to my perennial. Yeah, so let me say a bit more yeah. about suffering, because the, the, so their view is, is that, is that the, they need, he need, he was seditious um, from the political point of view. Uh, he was mm -hmm. undermining their authority. Um, right. So he had to be removed. Um, right. So he right. died. He died for his activity and his outspoken criticism. Right. Um, so he was a martyr, uh, in right. in a sense. Right. And what I think, yeah, I mean, if you stand up for your beliefs against authority, then you're liable to suffer. I right. mean, it, it's been in the case of mystics and prophets um, throughout the ages. Um, they're, mm -hmm. they're never thought. To be a good thing by the establishment, um, exactly. and but what what I think is is um, is extraordinarily interesting. I've been thinking a bit myself about redemptive suffering, um, and the <clears throat> the the inspiration of this. Um, the people who who die for something that you know is noble, right. um, they they don't just give up, and this applies right. to the Catholics. They didn't give up and say, okay, right. uh, you win, I'll just convert to Catholicism. They said, no, I'm right. going to take. Right. Um, and well, like uh, their whole mission was, I need to live a life that means something and work towards these goals because it's going to be around and around and around we go until I do, right? So that would help explain, hey, they're, they're looking at their afterlife as well and where they're going to land were they not yes i think that's too narrow a conception i mm -hmm. don't think they're thinking mm -hmm. about themselves personally um 
uh, and uh, I, I, I think that helped when you're throwing yourself on yeah. a Oh in yeah, no, I mean the the death is horrendous, yeah. um, and there are yeah. eyewitness accounts of of them not crying out, um, and really the bravery uh -huh. under under wow. suffering uh, below, which is must have been, I, you can't imagine anything can't more imagine. deteriorating. Right, but and it seems it it, it, it seems to me really, that suffering it seems to me that suffering is is required. In other words, there's a a, a a a surrender to 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 a larger to a process larger than myself, which is, um, which is going to include suffering. it's going to include suffering, mm. but not not a purposeless suffering at all. Uh, it is it is a, a suffering that that allows us to learn more how to love in in yes. a, in the most basic yeah. uh, way. That's the most that's really the bottom line of the whole deal. Like facing our, the dark night of the soul as well, right? I mean, mm -hmm, we mm -hmm. hold ourselves Shattered. accountable. It's yeah. not not easy. Growth right. isn't easy. Yeah. I, I I asked my question also because I had been um, just uh, looking at some material uh, around um, evolution of consciousness, and that if we if we understand uh, Jesus as a ascended master, that his consciousness would have been at such a a level that he would not have. Uh, physically suffered uh, when he was put to death, mm -hmm. and I I found that trouble. I just couldn't put those together quite. Yeah, in my I'm not understanding sure of that. suffering. <clears throat> um, I mean the 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 docetists in in the in the early Christian period, yeah. they said he wasn't really a substantial being at all. Yeah, uh, so yeah. a lot of debate went on in the first few centuries about who Jesus was and what he was constituted of. Um, Still happening. He was wholly human, <laughs> wholly divine, or or the divine in any yeah, part of the world. Right. You know, all right. of this. So that this was all. This was a, a, a subject of considerable theological debate. Um, right. But I, I, I don't. I, I answer the question. Uh, yes, I mean he, he might have had, had the capacity, um, to remove himself from his body. Um, during during the crucifixion i don't know yeah but it doesn't seem like that from you know what right. the, the right. accounts good question you know. yeah but but yeah. on the other hand you know the you can't really read the accounts as as something like a scientific paper right right you know? right. right and and you can't even yeah. you can't read the gospels as if they were literal either right. and one of the books i'm reading at the moment which is quite extraordinary um is is a commentary on the Gospel of Thomas um, mm. by a man called Roberto Pla, P L A, um, mm -hmm. and it's eight hundred pages. Um, <laughs> it's a lifetime quest you're on here. Yeah, to decipher um, all this, isn't but it? the point the point I just want to make about the, the why it's important um, is that he explains, and this is very apparent in the Gospel of Thomas. And most of the text of the Gospel of Thomas is in the in the Gospel of Beloved Companion, but contextualized. <laughs> And that's also very interesting. Um, right. The point he's making is that there's a hidden and a manifest level. Here. Yes. And um, and the uh, the manifest is literalism, and um, you know what's apparent on the surface. But the hidden, right. hidden right. is all about discovering the Son of Man within the inner Christ. Yeah. The right. re the gnosis realization that that you are the I am. I am right. the I am. We all yeah. are. I am, and that right. our basic essence uh, is the essence of the divine. Correct. And that is right. that is the is the core of Christian mysticism. Right. right. So you right. have that and, and Hindu in, in Hindu philosophy. Yeah, right. 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 Exactly. Yeah. I mean the right. the, the, the right. Brahman. Right. Brahman Thank you, Thank you so much, Bernice. Well, thank you. Thank Look you. I just thank fascinated you about your work Bernice. in the divine feminine. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Well, so we I have... just want to say that the hidden and the manifest levels, I I was having a conversation with another member of our community and guest, Janet Rudolph, and we were talking about how in the context of these cultures and their writings and their myths and their folklore and even <clears throat> their understanding of the words and concepts behind the words, there were a lot of coded messages. There were a lot of layers of meaning 
their understanding and their context, they would look at an element of a myth and they would have deep, deep, deep meaning that we've lost today. So they're reading their, uh, their culture very differently than even we can decode through our best efforts. There was layers and layers and layers upon layers of meaning. So- Well, that's why Jesus avenue. spoke in parables. Yes, yeah. One I little mean, phrase exactly and one little right. element had volumes behind it. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So. Well, I'm going to go to it. I was going to mention myself personally. It was like, that was a trigger for me as a teenager, yeah. this concept of Christian mysticism. And because you're brought up in this culture yeah. with a very simplistic description of what Christianity is. And then you start looking at uh, getting behind the veil and looking at more and more of the details and just little nuggets of, of data and information and knowledge. And all of a sudden it inspires something much grander in that whole journey of, of uh, connecting to that that uh, religious beliefs that surround you. So that was a that was a significant part of it. And what you're doing, David, is going so far beyond the way that you're connecting the dots. It's so significant. I'm so so pleased to have this opportunity to talk with you about this. Well, and as you mentioned, the changing of the language, um, also the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Mm. Like we're women in any of that, right? If the Spirit right, was neutral. The spirit and I are one is neutral, but not the father and I are one. Do you want to comment that, on that, that David? Well, that, well, that, well that's the, whole, the whole point is the spirit was feminine. Mm, yeah. yes. And it was it's the Holy Sophia. And it's, Anne Baring's done quite a lot of work on this, and so has Margaret Barker. And I I haven't read Margaret Barker's work directly. I've only read it through Anne Baring and, and um, Betty Kovacs. Um, but the, the up until... The first temple, um, which which lasted until 621 BC, um, there, there was Asherah as the divine consort. Um, oh, that's right. The Back from the Mesopotamian yeah. religions. Um, and so you, and this, the the men basically, the new uh, priestly authorities just got rid of all, the, got rid of the feminine, and mm -hmm. they smashed all the the images. I see. And then then it became and they're basically a, a, a patriarchal system and uh, and so that that's so the divine feminine the soul um was just removed from the scene I see. Yeah, yeah. you can also see this history where those in the mesopotamian uh cultures as they grew into their city states their mythologies changed so suddenly um tiamat and and uh, is squashing the goddess and you can just see the suppression of the mother goddess and the goddess in all her forms in those eras and the rewriting of those myths yeah. and the ascension of the patriarchy. It's like all so clear and written there. I guess, you know, Bernice uh, brought up suffering in general. I guess my two big questions about suffering for a later debate is, can any of us truly be healthy and fully realized in our sick culture? Our culture is, is imbalanced and it's ill. And um, this the, yeah, and then when we are wounded, um, part of part of the response to wounding is to think that that's standard, and then you can go around and wound others if you've been wounded. Hey, I survived it. That's just the way things are, and you're you're giving yourself permission to wound others. So, this is a big job to heal this culture, isn't it? But, but it's so of, important if we don't heal it. Branch. We, yeah, it's root, root and branch. We have to first of all, we have to take take trauma seriously um, and yeah. much more seriously than we than we do and our whole culture is 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 well it's fragmented um it fragments our attention um and and it, it it's it's creating a huge volume of mental health problems and emotional spiritual health problems at the moment which are not they're byproducts um of the of what's actually driving the system this system is power and materialistic values um and I think I I, that one, I have a Palestinian friend um, who's a non-violent Christian. Um, and he, I was listening to him the other day and he said, you know, when you get absolute trauma, um, absolute fear and absolute power, you get absolute disaster. Mm. Yeah. And I, I, I thought that was a very good shorthand of, of what's going on because... Uh, and other people have pointed out that there's a there's a traumatization and then there's a re-traumatization. You no, know, so October the seventh is a re-traumatization 
But then you've got the tra- the continuing trauma. You know, I, I'm not going to get into the politics of it, but the it, it's just making the point that um, we this is perpetuated by the assumption that violence can bring about peace. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank and that you. to me is a fundamental misconception, and that you know, in order to to prepare for peace, you have to prepare for war. Um, and so the whole dynamic is based on fear of the other and competition. That if I don't do what the other person is doing, they're going. I'm going to get behind. And besides, there's a lot of money to be made um, in the sort of militaristic system. And and if I don't invent lethal autonomous weapons for the Russians right. or whoever, then you know we'll be at a disadvantage. I saw Krishnamurti talking to the Los Alamos scientists, oh, yeah. 1984. Um, you can see it on online. Yeah. And he his the last question um, he was asked was, what would you do if you were director of the Los Alamos laboratory? Wow. And he, he, he thought for a moment and he said, it's not the right question. Mm. Um, this... The, the research in this institute is devoted to destruction. He just said that, devoted to destruction, and just allow that to sink in. And he then said, the question we should be asking ourselves is, how can we live at peace together? Thank you. Um, we're going to go to Dan next, but I wanted to also, as we talk about wounding and suffering, and healing that I want to just acknowledge Fred Smith, who's given us many talks on his um, witnessing of um, ritual in the Himalayas and how it's always a family issue or a village issue. It's not an isolation. And it's a dynamic of a culture and just being human and it's that we're all connected. And I just want to also say that we, we can't heal alone this isn't about us healing alone or biohacking ourselves. Mm. Um, this is about coming together as one world and one right. family of man and women and uh, healing. And so uh, everything you're saying today, um, thank you, David, and all the work that you're doing. Thank you. Um, the Cathars, I was talking about all of the generations who have also had this vision for love and healing. You know, thank you. And can we carry it on today? What is our job? Yeah. And on. I'll just mention that, interestingly, the 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 land of our institute is just a few miles away from Los Alamos, and so each day as miles. we as we go up to the hilltop to greet the sun, we look one direction and greet the sun, and we turn the other direction, and there's Los Alamos in the other direction, and there's that feeling of where <laughs> the intensity of that energy being there, what it means, and what's going on there. We have no idea, but the the idea being that. Um, um, it's, uh, you know, trying to hold, hold space and maybe coming back to that other question about, you know, is it something that th- these challenges, these, these, these dichotomies we see within civilization is part of that, that sacred journey for us to, uh, to, for this, the sacred clown, this idea that we have to somehow navigate around all of these, all of these different, um, blockages within our civilization as as a human story and on an individual level recognize that level so it's, it's some you know, you're clicking on my menu okay uh so so we recognize our role and how it comes back to the individual that the individual consciousness and the role that we play and how we have to navigate this world of of uh deception and and, and challenges around us so and if you don't have well, your voice another, another angle on this i went to see my son george um, play in a performance of Twelfth Night uh, in Bristol last weekend, and and the in in quite a number of Shakespeare plays, you you have the fool mm-hmm. and right. the trickster, and the fool is the one who actually tells you what it is actually happening. The yes. fool tells you the truth. The fool says the emperor has got no clothes. Yes, and so I I think this is a. I've come to think, just be thinking about this in the last few days, that this is a very important function. And so at all the, I'm a member of the International Futures Forum, and Ooh. we used to have a cartoonist um, at all of our meetings to make fun of what we were doing. 
And, and I think this is great principle to apply to these terribly serious meetings. Yeah. Um, that yeah. first of all, people should dance together before they start, start talking at all. That's mm. one of my ideas. <laughs> and secondly, that there should be clubs and fools um, telling people the background of what they're saying and how they need to look at the larger picture. And imagine if you had a fool at the World Economic Forum in Davos. In fact, you need quite a lot of fools, I think, to go back <laughs> because they have well, lots of little sessions. Yeah, and coming back to that point, I mean, that's a, the interesting thing about being surrounded, the land in New Mexico, surrounded by Pueblo culture. When they do their 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 sacred dances, there's they're all there's this very strict and, and formatted um, for, um, structure that happens during ritual. But then there's the sacred clowns dancing in between and doing things to to disrupt, to hold that other side of the balance, to keep things going. And it's always been such a significant part of, of watching what's going on and, and how they recognize that need to exist. Yeah. Uh, Dan, did you have your hand up for about 10, 15 minutes now? How about <laughs> give you a chance to ask your question? There was a uh, English psychiatrist named Arthur Gordon. In 1982, he wrote a book called The Psychic Dimensions of Mental Health. Uh, so it isn't about that, but in, I don't know if it was an official regressions he was doing or just when he was calling on people's subconscious. And he said he had a, a number of people who were reincarnated with Cathars. It all came, you know, that seemed strange. They all came at this time and they all came to visit him. <laughs> just seemed strange. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever heard that or heard about him. Yes, I, I know about that. Uh, Arthur Gurdon, I think is what is the man you're talking about. Yes. Um, and he, well, he was a he was a psychiatrist living in Bath. Um, I never knew him, sadly. I, I wish I'd gone and met him. But he was also a member of the Scientific and Medical Network, oh. um, interestingly, or well, not surprisingly. And you're quite right. Um, he he started having. with memories from a Cathar lifetime. Uh, and that 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 started on the process of trying to piece all this together. And he wrote he wrote a number of books, including a book on the, the ideas of the Cathars mm. and the Cathars and reincarnation. Maybe there are four or five books. I think I've I've got most of them. And um, and so this the 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 regression here um is 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 a very interesting um, point and the convergence of experiences and there's some evidential um, aspects to this as well so uh, I think there's quite a lot of people who come to this area um, who feel this kind of affinity um, for for the Cathars and feel that they've come back here for for a reason and indeed Are you one of them David you know Jeanne I, I wouldn't I, I, the but I would only go so far as to say that I have a very strong sense that I've always been in this Gnostic stream. Mm -hmm. And and the way that I, I discovered this, my alignment um, in this life well, was through the Bulgarian, you know, Peter Dunov, mm -hmm. um, and, and the, the realization that a lot of the principles that he was um, standing for were, were those same universal principles. Um, and I, 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 my, my book on this, by the way, is called Profit for Our Times. Profit as in P-H-E-T, not oh. F-I-T. <laughs> Profit for Our Times. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and that's an introduction to his work and, and um, extracts from, from his teaching. And in it, I, I talk about the relationship between the Bogomils and, and the Cathars. Um, and so this, this, this represents the inner side, the inner esoteric side um, of, of Christianity, and I think this is what we really thirst for now, um, is to have this um, this inner reality and experience yeah. of, of what it is to have an insight into our shared essence. Yeah, I appreciate the culture in which I live because there's just a whole smorgasbord. There's a menu of avenues to to uh, to find your way there. Right. Yeah. There's many, 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 many roads nowadays available. Yeah. And that we have this unprecedented access to our history and our past. Yeah. So we've got a lot more tools to to find that. So One point on that, um, and that that's that 
um, I think you have to choose um, a way up the mountain. Um, in other words, you have to go into depth in a particular tradition. Otherwise, you're just going around the foothills um, to decide which path you're going to take. It doesn't, in a sense, matter enormously which path you're taking, so long as you're going that. up. Or, or, you know, the thing is that the, the, there are these two metaphors, the matter of going up, in which is a matter of height and ascension, then it's a matter of going into the depths and the roots, which is the descent. And both, you actually need both. You need an ascent and a descent. Thank you. I appreciate what you're saying. And that's why I left a uh, radio career to dive into doing this work deeply. Um, but I appreciate that we can find what we resonate with. I appreciate that there's no. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, we've got a lot more and available. And yeah, many that's... openings to go deep or to yeah. go to go climb the mountain. I appreciate that. Well, and, I'm um, going to go to Fred next. But before I yeah. go to Fred, I'm going to mention that Tony in the chat room said, gosh, all these titles. Is there any way we can get a reading list? <laughs> can I you send us a reading list when I we post it? When we post If it this works for you to do, and that's a lot of work. But it, you've listed about 30 incredible publications. This could come well, I, might, I, I might have. Uh, I'll have a look. I can't okay. guarantee because I think I might have a um, a sort of general reading list. Okay. Um, Thank but you. I'll, I'll, have to, I'll have to have a look because it's a while since I access that um we'll take a general reading list yeah it may not be actually it may be in another thing so it's a um, starter list we could do that yeah. all right well let's add add fred to the discussion uh thanks um paul uh yes david it's very fascinating i'm i, I don't know where to begin there's there's so much material here i've i've read a few a few things about the cathars over the years but i've never specialized in it but there's so much that's, that's resonant about um, what you find in certain, like, um, more or less um, dualistic or even kind of panentheist um, Indian religion and, and even amongst, uh, you know, Sufis. Um, and there's, there seems really a lot of stuff that's very common in Islamic mysticism in, among the Cathars also. So the, you know, the, the influence from that direction is, you know, pretty, pretty solid. I don't think anybody's going to argue that. And um, but I, a question I had, where we kind of started talking about it, but never quite got very far because maybe it wasn't important, was um, the, you know, the aftermath of the Cathars. What what kind of oh, philosophical or spiritual aftermath was there after they more or less disappeared? That's a that's a very interesting question. I mean, there were. Other groups, the Valdenses, um, there was groups in north of Italy, um, there were there was groups in Bulgaria, you know, who were Gnostics um, and who were, you know, correspondingly questioning authority. And I, I, I think it, I think the general answer to your question is it, it all had to go underground. Well, yeah, but from there, it, it, it became it... so dangerous to be associated with these with this movement I yeah, but mean, what goes underground plants seeds and comes back up again well you see that's what i think happened with this tradition um you know that that then published the gospel of the beloved companion mm -hmm. uh, uh, and so they they went underground for centuries um, and and known only to themselves and 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 they but they kept they kept the tradition and practices going and probably developed a few along the way. And in fact, one of the features of um, the, the tradition, as I understand it, um, is, is the is physical endurance. Um, and, and so Jeanne, Jeanne de Quillon herself will be found on a mountain bike. <clears throat> She's 75 um, and she'll be on a mountain bike probably every day. Um, and it's not uh, all she'll be doing she'll be doing a walk with a 20 kilo um, pack on her back. Um, and so these, these, these people are very strong and resilient, um, at least in the current tradition. Um, and I think that it's really the, what's important, I think, is, is to tune back into the spirit and and ask yourself, um, when I go into my depths, um, what, what can emerge?
from that? Um, and that's really the question I, I'm asking myself. I've written a lot of poetry in the last few years. Um, and, and I know that the poetry that I've written, particularly the poetry I've written this year, um, you know, comes from uh, a place that I can hardly reach. Mm. We'll put it that way but but that's what gives it resonance because it means that you can then speak to the depths of other people mm -hmm. and so i think the spirit is all, always ready to be reborn Beautiful. so that we that you would consider a, a legacy of the cathars well um, not exclusively no because i think the 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 i think this this emphasis on I mean, the sort of Gnostic revival, if you like, um, you know, the, there has been a Gnostic revival since 1945, you know, with with uh, the Gnostic Gospels and the and the huge influence on influence now of SBNRs, you know, spiritual but not religious. Yeah, oh, probably uh, quite a few people on this call would identify themselves as SBNRs. Raise your hands. Let's yeah. your hands. <laughs> um, and that that's. And that's non-denominational, um, but it's, I mean, it's, as do, Peter Dunoff said, it's always the spirit of God that teaches in every age. And so the teachers are, are simply the mouthpieces of divine love and wisdom um, and truth um, that, that have to be, we have to keep on saying this. Um, it has to be present in the culture. And let me just go back to one idea that came up a few minutes ago, because I meant to mention it at the time. Um, this, this one of the books I've read this week um, it is this one here. Um, uh -huh. Restoring, Restoring Sanity. sanity. Yeah. By Margaret Wheatley, Meg Wheatley. Um, and it's a very practical book. Um, but the, 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 what she talks about, she says our culture is so um, far gone. In, in, you know, in terms of disintegration and collapse, yeah. uh, that we have to create what she calls islands of sanity. And then she explains how to do it. And so I'm, I've been thinking about the Scientific and Medical Network, our community, as an island of sanity, where people can come and your institutes, an island of sanity. Mm -hmm. um, and you might like to read the book um, to think about how you can apply its principles and methods, you know, to where you are and how you're how you're developing. Because the, and I think Eric Fromm would probably have agreed, you know, what do you, how do you how do you how can you maintain your sanity in an insane society? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and you you have to get back to the. This is where the Dunoff Dunoff's principles are so important. These are five principles. The three principal ones are love, wisdom, and truth. And then the supplementary ones, making five, which is the pentagram, um, are justice or equity and goodness or virtue. So the whole point is to embody these principles, not a belief system. It's about embodying the principles. It's interesting that we have to be heretics in today's society where before, if it wasn't such a sick society, this would be standard, right? This would be the order of the day. But now, in order to espouse that, you become a heretic in this upside down. Well, world. I, you know, I think the yeah, I've been thinking about the relationship between mystics, prophets, and heretics, mm -hmm. um, and often they're the same people. Yeah, thank you. Thank you know, I mean, I think I think the yeah. Orthodox Church would regard Peter Dunoff as exactly a mystic, prophet, and heretic. But <laughs> yeah. the point is that he, the the mystics and the prophets are directly connected to the divine source. Yeah. That's my They're point. not just writing about it or representing it. They are it. Yeah. Um, I also want to say that you described this extraordinary 75-year-old woman out there mountain biking and hiking. Um, I just want to say that nature, she's also in nature. And um, Lorianne has posted in the chat room, our church is nature. When we spend time outdoors, she heals us. So I think that's also part of this prescription for sanity and balance and just appreciating mm. our home planet, our environment, where and, we are. And so, maybe that's what Carthar's got it wrong is they didn't recognize the incredible gift 
of spirituality that surrounded them in this world, in this life. In well, this, I, this again, I, that's that's. I think that's an oversimplification okay. from from the historical. I don't think that Jeanne de Quillon would take that view. Um, and, and, and and I think there's a um, because they were they were engaged with people mm -hmm. all the time, and and I think you have to remember that that in in the medieval period. Um, the the this life wasn't considered um, the most desirable life. It was heaven you were aiming for, and the whole and the church kept people in control um, by threatening them with hell. Um, uh, and that, if you look at all the major French cathedrals, have pictures of the Last Judgment. Um, and and you were told if you didn't behave yourself, you're going down, not up. But you I think know, what Paul's reacting to is this general consensus in our society that the material world, I mean, there's that parallel thought, mm -hmm. the material world is unimportant, it's just spirit. But what we are mm -hmm. finding is that the material world is the other side of the coin to the spiritual, and that it's very important to be the container that it's through our, our physical right. bodies mm -hmm. that we, and our minds and our brains that we can behold. Yeah. The, yeah, no, I, the I, I conduit. This, this is the mechanism for the conduit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think it's what yeah. it's Paul's reacting to, but, oh my, well, we're at the end of our time and thank you, Fred, Fred again. Yeah. And I just want to say that I see Carol in there who always has something beautiful to say. And I want to hear from Lorianne who's been putting some very wise okay. chat into the, into the chat room if she would like to speak comment, as well. Carolyn. The Carolyn, thank you. It's good to. Oh geez, put me on the spot. I've just loved this, um, and I and I've loved a few things that you've said, David, about um, you know we're all from one, and it's that old saying from when we were little, isn't it? Do unto others as you would have done to yourself. And uh, yeah, so that really strikes a chord, and. Um, Kuyamange Institute is definitely one of my safe havens. Wow. Thank you. So I love that, that thought about that. That's beautiful. Mm. And thank you. I think this is about remembering who we are, because if this is truly what we are at, at our core, then this is about remembering. This is about being here on a planet and a lifetime and a culture in which we are challenged to remember, to find our way home. Right. And it's, it's all about, you know, coming full circle, right? Back to our origins. Yeah, it's a little exercise in strengthening ourselves and testing ourselves, isn't it? So thank you for being a, a way shower today, uh, David. Thank for all the work that you're doing, both in the sciences. I'd love to talk more about what the sciences are finding that underscore the it validity relates. of all that we're saying. Perhaps you can point us in some directions to some of your colleagues. And uh, thank you for this today. You did a wonderful job of tying all this together, mm. um, past, present, and future, and showing us all these threads in our culture that we're still, we're still weaving, right? We're the weavers of the moment. Mm. And what we're doing now, collectively, is so important with um, continuing this long, long story. And where are we heading with this? And what you can know, we sit with right. to see what wants to emerge mm -hmm. and where where's the next step of evolution? Where are we going? Yeah. And, yeah. and to tie that together, David, uh, you know, your ability, you, you have like a, yeah. a file cabinet in your brain and you, you pull up <laughs> data and information yeah. and quotes and, and book titles and your Long research. Sense. I mean, yeah. this is this is a skill set that humanity needs to maintain before we all turn over to AI and don't do it ourselves. So uh, <laughs> you're, you're, you're very impressive with your ability to retain, yeah. retain all of that data and information so eloquently. And, you know, I also want to do one final question, I think is, <clears throat> where do you want to go? And with the rest of your your journey here, you you spend a lifetime building all of this research together and tying these dots together. What will satisfy you at that moment where you say, "Okay, now I'm transitioning off this planet"? What is it that I accomplished, and what what is it that I wish I would have done more of, or what would I want to make sure that I did accomplish before that happens? Well, I feel I'm <clears throat> I'm on track in my blueprint, um, if you like. Yeah. Um, and, and I, I think the, I think the work of an elder, though, know, and I am in that phase of life now, 
is is this deepening work um being being there for other people and growing continue to grow reinvent yourself um see what you can learn from nature um because mm -hmm. the same processes are reflected in human life as goethe understood and yeah so i think that's really i mean this uh, deepening my understanding of these five principles and application of the five principles Beautiful. Uh, that seems to me a very good compass direction um, <laughs> and, uh, you know if we the, the the great mystics have always said it's about love and wisdom mm. or love and compassion or that's what it's fundamentally about um, and i that's the lesson of the near-death experience for instance yeah you know love i also want to say that felicitas goodman would say you can take everything away all the knowledge-based way and we'll still rediscover it why because it's true because it bubbles up within us because we are designed right to operate on these principles this mm -hmm. is in our core being and structure again and again this will bubble up and we'll find our way mm -hmm. so i take hope in that yes and just a, just a, a couple of um, notices, as it were. One, <clears throat> one is that if you Google Scientific and Medical Network, we have a weekly webinar program, which is at oh. the US friendly time, Canada, North America friendly time. Um, and we've got uh, a book on, uh, we've got presentation this coming week on philosophy of biology. Um, that, that's, the, that's the next one, very, very important. And then we have a Galileo Commission where we, we do more specialized work on consciousness. Um, and uh, science and consciousness and we've got a lecture coming up so go to galileocommission.org and become a friend so thank you so much i David. think the conversation continues and I, well, it's oh, like, yeah yeah okay Absolutely. well thanks very much for your invitation and uh, we'll be in contact all right thank you so much great david thank you for making okay, it today. thank you so Wonderful. much bye right. everyone